Hi, everyone, and welcome to Saving Seeds from the Garden, a live online workshop with Boundless Landscapes. I'm Jess Rainey, a Programs, Events, and Outreach Specialist at the Boulder Public Library. And normally, we do lots of garden workshops that are hands-on and in the garden. But this year, since the garden's not open, we're bringing our seed to table content to you. And we've had a wonderful time partnering with Boundless Landscapes, a Boulder company. And in specific, we've had the treat of working with Farmer Fern, who made our gardening tutorial mini series. And tonight we're gonna do a deep dive into seed saving. And before I hand it over to her, I wanna thank the Boulder Library Foundation for their generous support of this and many other wonderful programs at the library. One more thing to note, just to make tonight a little bit more exciting is that Fern has a fire that is near her house. Right now she's safe, but we may hear some sirens in the background or she may have to duck out and be evacuated. So I just want to thank you, Fern, so much for still doing the workshop tonight, <laughs> despite the chaos that's happening outside of your house. And I'm thrilled to learn from you. So we'll, I'll hand it over to you and I'll stay on the screen to uh, kind of convey questions and, and be available. But Fern, take it away. Thank you, Jess. I wanna echo your gratitude to the Boulder Library Foundation and to Boulder Public Library. I'm Fern, fondly known as Farmer Fern. And if that title doesn't give it away, I am a farmer and a seed saving enthusiast. And so tonight, I was hoping to put together a workshop that led everyone through the tangible step-by-step -step process for how to save seeds from your own garden. Um, this is in partnership, obviously, with Boulder Public Library, as well as Boundless Landscapes, which is a local company that is working to turn the world into a garden through the installation of micro farms across Boulder um, and Boulder County. So thank you to Boundless Landscapes. So a brief overview of tonight. Tonight we're going to cover what seed saving is, um, the cultural and the environmental importance of doing seed saving, and then how to do it. So a little step by step and we'll play a video at the end that was shot over the course of a couple days um, that will walk you through the process for um, everything from what tools you'll need to then how you actually do it. So really our goal for today is that you leave here feeling confident with the steps that um, you need to take in order to save seeds either this season or even next season because really it's never too soon to plan. So let's start with what seed saving is. <laughs> I would call it an art form, really. Um, it was something that's been practiced for thousands of years by communities, um, which often, you know, work together to decide who's going to save what seeds. Um, so rather than modern day, you know, you're ordering your seeds online or you're going into maybe a hardware store and picking up your seed packets, um, seeds were saved from the fruit and from the garden every season. And so seed saving is really a practice that is rerouting ourselves in that. Uh, so today we're going to focus on um, harvesting seeds from heirloom and open pollinated varieties. And in a little bit, I'll explain what those are. Um, rather than uh, the seed saving practice of intentionally crossbreeding varieties to achieve a new variety. Um, so this will just be focused on maintaining existing varieties. So and Fern, I was just gonna, sorry to interrupt, I just, your video quality is just a little bit blurry. So um, if anyone watching has difficulty understanding something, if you can just drop a question in the chat and we'll go back and have Fern clarify, just because of with the fire and all of the emer emergency vehicles nearby, there's been some interruptions of her, her Wi-Fi that she's carrying on. Oh. Yeah, we have some helicopters overhead, so <laughs> I think everything's just getting a little jumbled. But anyway, uh, we will pause uh, every little bit to answer those questions as well. So they will be addressed not at the end, but then periodically throughout the whole thing. Uh, so seed saving. Um, in recent years, I would say since industrialization, the pressure of perpetuating and improving and adapting seed lineages has mostly fallen on seed companies, um, which is a big you know, pressure to hold. Uh, but due to this transition from gardeners and community saving seeds to company saving seeds, since the 1900s, we have lost 75% of crop diversity. And a lot of those crops cannot be resurrected. So they would essentially be extinct, like animals go extinct, 
certain lineages of seeds and certain varieties can go extinct. Um, this is for many reasons. Uh, Cross-pollination would be a large one, as well as the patenting and the privatization of certain seeds. And so folks no longer may be growing and saving their heirloom varieties of um, you know, seeds at home has also really contributed to this. And so one of our goals for tonight is that you feel empowered enough as you leave here to go ahead and take part in bettering a seed lineage. We also feel that it's really important that homeowners uh, feel empowered enough to save their seeds because it's beautiful and it's delicious. And it continues the growth of some of our favorite heirloom crops, mine being Cherokee purple tomatoes, which I'll talk about an absurd amount tonight. Um, and it also protects biodiversity, something that's very, very necessary in this day and age. Along the front range, uh, there are multiple smaller seed organizations working to adapt seeds to the high altitude climate that we have here. The one that is full of early frosts like we saw this week or, um, you know, full of really late frosts or hail or what have you. And so um, it's pretty lovely that we do have some local organizations and companies in the area that are doing that work. I just want to do a shout out to Masa Seed Foundation. They're working to regionally adapt many seed lineages to this area. And so as you go throughout this workshop and you may wonder, well, where can I get my hands on some heirloom and open pollinated seeds? Go ahead and check out Masa Seed Foundation. And the other call to action that I have is that whether you are growing in five gallon buckets on your apartment balcony or you have a large in-ground plot, um, you can be saving seeds from those plants. So you know, get to it, really. <laughs> and one quote that I've always found inspiring is from Matthew Dillon of the Organic Seed Alliance. He says that seed knowledge is eroding even faster than seed biodiversity. And in the spirit of being lifelong learners, I think it's important that um, us home gardeners or us enjoyers of wonderful heirloom crops all do a little bit to learn how to save um, save this biodiversity, right? Preserve it and to preserve this deliciousness, really, because I like to root it back in how things taste. <laughs> Jess, do we have any questions so far? Yes, we have one question. Um, if you could clarify what exactly heirloom means, is Ooh, it like a we're gonna purebred go pet? Yeah, we're going to go over heirlooms and open pollinated in a second here. And I'll try to really define any of these new words that I might be introducing for people. But if there's one that you're still kind of confused on, go ahead and ask. But we'll be, we'll be at that in one second. All right. So let's go on to what materials you're going to need in order to save seeds. Um, I've probably spent a total of $5 in my life on materials for saving the seeds because many of them serve other purposes in the home and garden. Um, so the materials you need really depend on the types of seeds that you want to save. In general, I would recommend, um, of course, the heirloom or open pollinated seeds themselves. Um, I like having a mesh screen. So if you have a window screen you've taken out or maybe you make paper and you want to use a paper making screen, that's perfect. Uh, I also recommend having some painter's tape and a good Sharpie for labeling your varieties because oh, I've had a mix up a couple different times in my life <laughs> with that. And then small paper bags or glass jars for storing the seeds um, is, is always advised. And then also larger paper bags for drying seeds out. That's also a great um, little purchase to have. And lastly, uh, if you have a shelf in your house that comes fall as your designated seed saving shelf, that's wonderful. It's good if it's in a location out of direct sunlight, if it's in a cooler location. Um, I would not advise having it in the kitchen near any appliances because as you turn on your stove or even your fridge, there's a lot of radiant warmth that can kind of mess with the seed saving process. So try to keep them in a cool, consistent temperature, relatively dark location. And now we're going to talk about what seeds you need. And this is where we're going to address heirlooms. So what are heirlooms? Uh, in your family, maybe it's something that's a value that's passed down for generations. And I would argue that heirloom seeds are essentially the same. They're a seed that's of value that is saved true to itself um, from generation to generation. And a lot of our favorite crops um, are actually heirloom tomatoes. 
Uh, they're usually prized for their beauty or for their wonderful taste, um, but they're a little bit harder to find in the grocery store or from a commercial grow location because those um, operations are usually growing something called hybrids. So hybrid seeds, unfortunately, are not wonderful for seed saving, uh, but they are wonderful for growing for if you're a commercial farmer. Um, they're known to have specific types of vigor. So maybe they have a wonderful disease resistance, or maybe they set a lot of fruit. And so far farmers like to grow them for their uh, little advantages in that way. But hybrid seeds occur due to um, intentional interference in the pollination process. So it's the artificial crossing um, of, or not artificial, but the intentional crossing of two different varieties within the same species. So if you were to cross two different types of tomatoes intentionally, um, then you would have a hybrid. Open pollinated seeds, which you'll often see abbreviated as OP seeds, are seeds that are very similar to heirlooms. Uh, all heirlooms are open pollinated, but not all, all, not all open pollinated seeds are heirlooms. Um, open pollinated seeds are, for all intents and purposes, uh, seeds that can be saved. Um, and are grown without interference in their pollination. And then I, a common question I get that I should address now is GMO seeds. So hybrid seeds are not GMO seeds. GMOs have been um, intentionally altered in their DNA for a certain reason. And so maybe that is for a pesticide resistance or even in the case of some GMO corns, it's so that their roots pr produce their own pesticide. Um, so very different thing. Um, and open pollinated heirloom and hybrid seeds can all be organic. So, like I said, unfortunately hybrid seeds don't make much sense for us tonight because if you try to plant that second generation of them, they won't actually grow true to themselves. Heirloom and open pollinated seeds, though, they can be saved and replanted and grow true to themselves, the same plant, same DNA from generation to generation. Um, and the cross-pollination, we'll talk a little bit about pollination, but the cross-pollination of open pollinated or, um, or heirloom seeds leads to them becoming hybrids. And so for that reason, we isolate our varieties, which again, I'll cover in a tiny bit. So, so far we've gone over what materials you're going to need in order to save seeds, and then uh, what types of seeds you'll need. So you'll need heirloom or open pollinated seeds, the way you find out if your seeds are open pollinated or heirloom is you look on the seed packet. And now let's talk cross pollination. <laughs> One of the largest concerns to have in mind when your goal is to save seeds from a plant is pollination um, and how it happens specifically. So pollination can occur from wind, it can occur from insects, be it bumblebees or um, you know, dragonflies, um, and it can also occur from human interference. The last way that pollination usually occurs is self-pollination, meaning that the plant is capable of pollinating itself and then reproducing on its own. For seeds to be saved and then grown with the same DNA parent, or as the same DNA as the parent, uh, they must be pollinated from the same variety. So either through self-pollination or through an isolation. Um, and that means we really want to keep an eye on or even control wind or insect pollination to our plants. So cross-pollination. It, uh, <laughs> oh, Jess is on oh, the screen now. Yeah, just you before question, you Jess? Move, yeah, just before you move to the, the next topic, there was a question. If there's a a way when you're buying a seed packet um, to know that it will be heirloom versus open pollination versus kind of, if you're buying something, how easy is it gonna be to save or what What do you need to know? It, like, will you be able to tell from a seed packet? Absolutely, so it is the law that seed packets denote what they are. Um, if you have an heirloom seed packet, it will say heirloom. If you have open pollinated, it'll usually say OP, open pollinated. And then if you have a hybrid, um, it's going to usually say hybrid or it will say F1, which denotes the first generation of that strain. And all seed packets will be labeled with that. Uh, you can also purchase from all heirloom or all open pollinated um, seed companies where there's really no searching that you have to do on the seed packets. 
I hope that helps. <laughs> so certain plants are more susceptible to cross-pollination than others. For example, um, peas, due to the botany of the flower, need very little isolation. And once you plant them, you don't have to think too much about cross-pollination being an issue. Um, beets, on the other hand, which are biennial, meaning that they set seed in their second season, um, they need two to five miles of distancing from other beet varieties in order to avoid cross-pollination, which is pretty wild if you are like me and you cannot guarantee your next door neighbor is not growing beets, <laughs> then there are other steps we can take to isolate those varieties, which I'll go over. So really one of the simplest ways to save seeds um, and what really large companies do is they isolate the plants. They plant them those isolation distances apart. You know, So for peas, it's 10 feet. For beets, it's two to five miles. For corn, it's over a mile. Um, and so they're working a lot with um, actual space, spacing out their different varieties of the same species. Saving seeds can be a little bit trickier in urban spaces because like I just said, uh, it's hard to guarantee that you have proper distancing, but it's definitely not impossible. And there are tools that um, a lot of companies have made to help home gardeners isolate their plants. So some of those tools would be um, blossom bags, which are just a wonderful invention that actually covers up the blossom on the plants to prevent pollinators from getting into them. And then the fruit grows within the bag. It's kind of a sheer muslin little white bag that you um, bag your plants with. Um, they also make cages so that you can cage an entire plant in its mature stages. Um, and then also I like to use physical barriers as in, you know, if maybe your backyard is like a farm and you just have, have your um, beets and nothing else in there, then of course the pollinators are gonna pollinate your beets and then move on to pollinate something else, which could be another beet. Um, if you have a lot of other plants to offer the pollinators, maybe you have a lot of perennials, maybe you have a hedge in your backyard that provides some amount of a barrier for pollinators and also wind, um, then it's less likely that cross-pollination will occur. And when you're thinking ahead to seed saving next year, it is nice to um, kind of rank plants <laughs> in terms of, okay, is this your first year seed saving? Well, I would grow this plant. Or is this, you know, your 10th year seed saving and you're a seasoned pro? Then maybe try growing a little bit more of a different variety and or a more difficult variety. So I'm going to rank them for you now just because I think that's helpful. The green plants, meaning they are the easiest to grow, they are the cheapest and simplest to isolate, would be tomatoes, peppers, beans, and peas. So those would be my green plants that if you, after this workshop, want to try saving seeds next year, it would be great to purchase heirloom or open pollinated seeds for those ones. Um, the yellow plants, which are a little bit trickier, but still easy enough in an urban garden, would be corn and spinach. And then the red plants, which are quite difficult, would be biennial roots, meaning they've um, seed their second season. So beets, chard, uh, carrots, onions, and then brassicas like kale and cabbage. Those are all a little bit trickier to save seeds from. So I would classify those as the red seeds. Tonight, later on, I'm gonna show you a video um, how to actually save the seeds from the green plants. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Uh, even though they are simpler to save seeds from though, they still do need certain types of isolation. Um, so let's talk about the different ways isolation can occur. Space, as we mentioned, um, not planting two species or two varieties of the same species within a certain distance of one another. Each uh, species has its own isolation requirements. And so there are a lot of wonderful charts online that you can uh, look up. Um, I use the one from Seed Savers Exchange that you can easily find on their website that will tell you the specific isolation distance requirements uh, per, the, per the variety you're growing. Cages, like I mentioned, are also um, a wonderful way, uh, especially if your plant is going to have some height to it, um, then you, know, you can pop a whole cage over the top of it. Um, and those cages are lined with a, a fabric that lets sunlight and water and air in but prevents pollinators from coming in. And then bags, which are a little bit more of an affordable option. So specifically blossom bags. Don't go using a 
brown paper bag or something that's not letting enough, you know, sunlight in. Um, those are also a wonderful way to isolate specific blooms on a plant from being pollinated. And I think, I think isolation and cross-pollination can be a little bit of a tricky topic. Um, so I want to walk you through how I would isolate tomatoes. <laughs> so luckily, tomatoes are generally a self-pollinated fruit, which means you could grow just one tomato plant, and that plant would still um, fruit and be able to set up another generation or another um, succession of that fruit. A lot of plants, you would have to put two types of the certain plants so that they can pollinate with one another. But tomatoes, they're self-pollinating. Um, and if you wanted to be extra careful with tomatoes, uh, you could use blossom bags on the flowers, although, like I said, they're self-pollinating. So generally, you don't have to worry about cross-pollination as much with a plant that is self-pollinated. The one caveat would be that sometimes bumblebees will pollinate flowers anyway. <laughs> they can be a little bit aggressive. <laughs> and so the blossom bags do help um, from, you know, bumblebees getting in there and maybe accidentally cross-pollinating with another tomato variety. Um, and then physical distancing for tomatoes is pretty simple. So I always plant my tomatoes that I'm wanting to save seeds from 10 to 50 feet away from other um, tomato varieties. And so if you have a garden um, or that is, you know, a large in-ground plot, maybe putting your tomatoes on opposite ends of it. Or if you have raised beds in your backyard, spreading them out so they're in different parts of your yard so you're not as worried about cross-pollination occurring. Uh, if the neighbors on the other side of your fence, say, maybe 15 feet away are also growing heirloom tomatoes and you're really wanting to preserve that variety and prevent cross-pollination, um, like I said, try to provide the pollinators with other things that they can stop at in between those tomatoes. So say a, a bumblebee accidentally pollinates your tomato plant and then goes and pollinates the lavender and then goes and pollinates your neighbor's tomato. That's a little bit better than directly tomato to tomato. And tomatoes are annual plants, which means they fruit in their first year, which is wonderful. So for that reason, I'm not concerned about my planting plan for next season, really, you know, making sure that um, I'm not accidentally going to, or I'm not going to have to leave the tomato in the field like you do beets in order to harvest those seeds. And then what the, the tomato seeds are mature when their uh, fruit is ripe to eat, which is pretty easy. Uh, some plants, it's a little bit of a guessing game when the seeds are mature and ready to be harvested. But if you're going to eat the tomato, then the seeds are mature in there. And across the board, it's very important when you're saving seeds from plants to pick your best plants. Harvest your first, if you will, for saving seed. Uh, you don't really want to harvest seeds and go through this process if that plant was diseased because it will potentially pass on that disease. Or if that plant in general did not have very high yields, um, maybe not that worth saving seeds from that season. You really want to pick your best fruits for saving the seeds from. And then I just briefly want to cover seed laws. Uh, <laughs> so all of this is regulated, believe it or not. Saving seeds, selling seeds, as I mentioned, the seed packets have to denote what they are. Um, and so seed laws are both legislated at a state level as well as a federal level. And then if states uh, don't really want to dive in too much to what their seed laws are, there is a recommended um, seed law that um, the federal government has put out that um, informs what other states uh, what they advise state seed laws look like. And that's called the Russell <laughs> Law. Um, it's R-U-S-S-L. And so um, before you're going and selling or saving or swapping seeds, it's very important that you look up your state's laws regarding um, the movement of seeds. You know, as I mentioned earlier, seeds are typically grown by seed companies now, which means a lot of certain varieties of seeds are actually patented and owned. And so anytime that seed moves across borders, theoretically, or moves to a new house, uh, theoretically, the owner of that seed should um, receive some amount of profits. Um, seeds are also legislated to prevent the movement of noxious weeds or invasive weed seeds. Um, and so, like I said, it's just really important that wherever you live, you're looking up the laws for your state regarding selling, um, swapping, or saving seeds. All right, 
Let's take a break and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Fern. I'm learning a lot. Um, we don't have any specific questions, but I'm assuming you'll address your and you're in California, but here in Colorado, mm -hmm. <laughs> we have had a total whiplash of weather. And yes. if you could maybe touch on that and how that might affect things, but maybe you have that plan for for later Absolutely. on. Okay. Let's go over that. So I am aware that there was a very early frost in Boulder and in the Front Range um, this year, which is ironic because right now I'm facing like 120 degree heat <laughs> where I happen to be at the moment. <laughs> and so, um, yes, the frost unfortunately does affect things. So if you, first of all, frost can affect seed viability. So if you had, um, fruit outside, say you had some dried pea pods on a plant that you were planning to harvest maybe next week, and then you didn't get to it, and they got hit by a hard frost, it's likely that the viability of those seeds, meaning um, their ability to grow in the future, or their germination rates have been drastically lowered, unfortunately. I also know that since the frost was so early this year, a lot of individuals trying to save, say, beans or peas, their uh, plants actually did not get to mature this year to the point in which the seeds were ready to be harvested. Um, and we'll go over um, how you tell if your beans and peas are mature in a little bit in the video. Um, but I do know that for a lot of different seed savers, it was kind of a hard growing season. That said, um, oh, mm -hmm. did you have something else? Jess? Oh, I was, I was, I was wondering if maybe there might be like a might be hope for people that are saving wildflower seeds that have to go through kind of a, a cold process. Yeah. Is that, if if they've question. matured by now, are those seeds potentially still okay? Yeah, they are. They're hardy, okay. um, obviously. <laughs> and so um, it's still possible to be saving wildflower seeds as long as they were mature prior to the frost. And that's only for varieties that are sensitive to frost. So some varieties may still be growing happily and fine. Um, I would say most of them, though, are probably done growing after this hard frost. And so there's this sweet spot when harvesting wildflower seeds where the seeds are mature, but the plant has not yet dropped them, meaning the plant has not yet dispersed them and let go of them into the wind or onto the soil. And uh, also that all of the birds have not come and eaten them <laughs> already. So there is a little sweet window for wildflower harvesting, and it's coming up. Um, and so I would say that those wildflower seeds are still viable. Okay, so that's some good news with the with the frost yeah, that those might have survived. <laughs> yeah, um, there is flavor grow and you're growing root vegetables or maybe spinach or something that you're planning on leaving in the field and it's frost tolerant, then obviously those are still okay um, because they go through a frost every winter before they're harvested. Um, so if you're someone at home growing carrots or beets or onions, I'm impressed with you and your seed should still be fine. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, there's one new question in the chat. Um, do certain mm -hmm. heirloom varieties do better in greenhouses to avoid cross pollination or is it generally better to plant outside? That's a great question. Um, I mean, there are definitely certain heirlooms and serpent, certain open pollinated varieties out there in different species that thrive in greenhouse settings, um, be it that they, oh, sorry, my home line is ringing, <laughs> uh, be it that they withstand the heat a little bit better maybe, or they like the humidity that greenhouses can provide. Um, but when you're reading a seed packet, sometimes it will actually tell you like perfect in a greenhouse or something. And I apologize that I have an answering machine <laughs> going off in the background. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I have seen in a few places um, like giant flower farms or large seed companies will grow things in greenhouses just to be really sure that they're isolating. Um, mm -hmm. So perhaps if you want to be completely pure with your seed varieties and you don't want to have to put bags on every single flower that you're saving, maybe that would be a, a reason to do greenhouses. Uh, yeah. And it depends on your different um, 
it depends on your greenhouse. So if you have a greenhouse that's completely sealed off from the outside and pollinators aren't getting in there and wind isn't getting in there and you're not um, wanting pollinators necessarily to come in, then that's a pretty safe way, especially if you're only growing one variety of a species. So you're only growing one type of heirloom tomato and one type of spinach, um, then that's a great way to prevent cross pollination. I also advise that people rinse their tools off and sanitize their tools between moving um, from different species to different species, just to make sure that you're not um, accidentally cross pollinating. Um, but you know, if you have like a high um, tunnel or something like that at your house and it's not completely sealed off, then you can't guarantee that a bumblebee isn't going to make its way in and do its thing. Um, most commercial grows who utilize those um, large greenhouses or large sealed off hoop houses or even really big, um, essentially like rows of um, cages that are lined, um, people who use those will put their own pollinators inside. So they'll bring bees and they'll put them inside of that greenhouse and inside of those cages so that they're not moving about and so that they don't have to worry about um, their plants not being pollinated. Thank you. I think that's the, the list of questions for right now. Um, oh, there was one other question about rose hips. So the person asking the question had read that they are supposed to have a light frost, but we've had a hard freeze. Are you familiar with mm -hmm. the process for saving those? Do you think those are still okay with our I would try that. that okay. Was your freeze down to about what was it, 24 in certain locations? I think I think it did get that low in some parts. It was a little bit of a weird situation, and this is why. First of all, snow is wonderful if you're hitting a hard freeze because it's a wonderful insulator. And so underneath the snow, it can actually be a lot warmer than it is just out in the air. Um, it's also a little bit of a weird situation because there was so much radiant heat from the um, temperatures that you had prior to the freeze, that the soil was still pretty warm and, um, you know, the, the general atmosphere in the area was still pretty warm. And so for that reason, I would definitely still try to harvest them. Okay, thanks. I will, I will hop off the screen and so see you move to the next section. Wonderful. We're we're actually um, pretty much ready for the demonstration videos. Um, I just want to give you know a little heads up to them. So I'm going to show you a video that I shot in my kitchen over the course of a couple days, saving some seeds from the garden. Um, I'm also going to have to verbally walk you through uh, peas and beans rather than showing you that process, just because I did not have a mature plant with me at the time. Um, one note though, um, oh, I wore a really matching outfit. These are different shirts, believe it or not. I guess I really love this color. <laughs> but um, one note I should add is that in the video, you'll hear me talk about the difference between immature seeds and mature seeds quite a bit. And I reference removing the immature seeds, which are usually floating on top of the surface of water. When I say to do that, all I mean is literally just scoop them out and dispose of them um, before then rinsing off the mature seeds. Um, so that's my little heads up before we play it. But otherwise, uh, why don't you go ahead and play it, Jess? All right, so we're in my kitchen and I'm going to walk you through step-by-step step how to save seeds from a few different types of fruit like tomatoes, peppers, beans, and peas. But before we do that, I wanna to talk to you about the two different types of processes for saving seeds. Um, the first type would be dry seeds. So dry seeds come from plants like beans and peas. And essentially dry seeds means that the seeds dry on the plant and then are harvested and should be kept dry until they are sown. But wet seeds, you harvest the whole fruit like this tomato here, and then send the seeds through a process of rinsing them off, sometimes fermenting them, and then drying them uh, for storage. So for both dry and wet seeds, dryness during storage is absolutely crucial to maintaining seed viability. All right, so I'm gonna walk you through saving the wet seeds from heirloom tomatoes. I love saving seeds from the garden, especially from tomatoes. I feel like it's so empowering because it's actually quite simple and it's a great way to maintain your heirloom varieties. Um, 
So what you're gonna need in order to save seeds from your tomatoes is a clean area, uh, a good knife, preferably one that's serrated, a clean jar that you've labeled with the variety and the date that you've begun saving them, the tomatoes themselves, a little rag for cleaning up because it gets a little messy. And then later on in the process, you're gonna need a space to dry your tomato seeds. I have this little mesh screen that I actually got from Art Parts in Boulder, um, but a paper towel will do just fine as well. So to begin saving the wet seeds from tomatoes, um, you can choose one of two paths forward. So the first path would be, you know, as you're making say a pico and you're wanting to um, save the seeds from some prized tomatoes of yours. All you really have to do is rinse them off really well, put them on a paper towel to dry and leave them there until they're really, really hard. It takes, you know, a week, two weeks. Um, and you can go ahead and put them in a bag for storage. But to really assist in germination the next season, I like fermenting my tomato seeds because it mimics the rot that happens when the tomato fruit falls on the ground. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna do a little fermentation. To start, it's quite simple. All you're gonna do is cut a little X in the bottom of your tomato, and then I tend to open it up. And you can see all the lovely seeds in there. And then you're gonna take your clean jar. I've already done a few tomatoes into it. But then you're just gonna scoop out the seeds. And it's okay if you get other gunk from the tomato in there, um, the center of them, whatever it may be. And try to get all of the seeds And once you've done that, the best part is you can still eat this. Uh, we were doing some tomatoes last night and then we had BLTs for dinner with the leftover carcasses. So it's perfect. And what you're gonna do is leave this jar of tomato seeds and goo um, in a warm spot for the next mm, two to seven days. To help in the fermentation process, I actually add a little bit of water, but don't add any more than 25% water by volume, um, or else it just, you know, can kind of dilute the mixture. Again, we're wanting to mimic the rot of the fruit itself. And so I leave mine covered, and in a few days, you'll notice that a thin layer of mold forms on top of the tomato, and that's how you know it's ready to go. So I'll check back in with you when that process begins. All right, so it's been a few days and I've kept my tomatoes in a warm location and every day I've checked on them and stirred them around a little bit. And today when I did that, I noticed that most of the seeds had sunk to the bottom and that a small white film uh, had formed on top. And so that's how I know these seeds are ready to go. So what I'm now going to do is uh, fill up this jar with water and then slosh it around and let it settle for a second. All right, as you can see, I have filled up this jar with some water from the tap and I've let it settle for a second. And what I'm looking at right now is that there are a lot of seeds on the bottom of this jar. If you lift it up and look underneath, you can kind of see the, the yellow of them. And then on top, what I'm dealing with are some immature seeds, which actually float to the top, and then some pith, which is kind of like the gunk, if you will, of the tomato. And so my next goal is to decant this until all of the immature seeds, pith, um, are, are gone and then the water is clear and at that point I know that I've rinsed the seeds well enough that there is no more pith on them and they're ready to dry. So what I'm not going to do is just pour them through the strainer until all of the floating stuff on top is gone um, and then I'm going to keep refilling the water and doing that until the water is clear. All right so as you can see all of the water is clear in here and the seeds are looking quite clean and ready to go. So all I'm going to do is now pour out the water and catch the seeds in this fine mesh strainer. Once I've done that, I'm going to move my seeds onto a labeled surface, such as a paper towel or even a nice linen towel or something. Um, and you can even do them onto a yogurt cup or something that you just have laying around. And I'm gonna spread them out so that they're in one thin layer, not stack on top of one another, not molding. And in a few weeks, well, I'm going to place this in a really dry location out of direct sunlight. And in a few weeks, these seeds will be dry, dry, dry to the touch. And at that point, they're ready to be stored in a paper bag uh, and kept in a dry, cool location until they're ready to be planted. Let's talk about a fun seed to save, and that is peppers. The isolation requirements for peppers are a little bit more complicated than peas and beans, um, but overall it's not too bad. So if you want to grow heirloom or open pollinated peppers to save for seed and you really want to maintain genetic purity, you're going to want to have a, a 160 foot 
isolation distance. And in addition to that, you could even opt for using the um, isolation bags, which will help prevent cross-pollination from happening. So for peppers, start with your nicest fully ripe peppers, and that means no green peppers. All peppers left on the vine will ripen past green, so they'll either be yellow, orange, red, or even purple or dark brown when you're uh, processing them for this. If you are working with a hot pepper, I'm gonna recommend that you wear gloves for this because the capsaicin can really burn your hands and burn your eyes, and it's really hard to wash off. This is just a plain heirloom bell pepper, so I'm not too worried about capsaicin burning my skin. Um, so the process for saving peppers requires a few tools. The first one would be access to clean water so that you can rinse the seeds, uh, something to um, sift the seeds through. And so if you have a tea strainer, that works great. Um, otherwise, I have this little um, sieve. And then a surface to dry your pepper seeds on. So some people will use, you know, like a paper towel and a yogurt lid container. Um, again, I have this little paper making um, mesh screen that I use for drying my pepper seeds on. So to start, you're going to remove all of the pepper seeds from inside of the plant by just scraping them off into some water. Let's see, I have some water here. And again, this is where it can be kind of spicy. All right, you'll now see that there are two layers to the seed. All of the ripe or mature seeds have sunk to the bottom of the water while all of the immature seeds and the pulp and pith have floated to the top. So what I'm now going to do is take out all of the immature seeds and this pulp and then rinse the mature seeds with more water until I feel like they're really, really clean. All right, so I did that a few times until my seeds looked really clean. And I moved kind of swiftly so that they weren't sitting in the water for too long. And now what I'm going to do is just empty out the seeds onto that mesh screen. And I'm going to label the screen with the variety. And when I have them on this mesh screen, I'm going to make sure that they're not staying on top of each other, that they're just one seed thick as a layer. That way they're not molding or rotting or touching one another. And they are um, able to dry out very evenly. And then in a few weeks, I'm just gonna take them off of the screen when they're really dry and store them in a paper bag, labeled and ready to plant for next season. All right, let's talk about two of the easiest dry seeds to save, peas and beans. And really, it could not be simpler. All you have to do for these is leave your healthiest, best looking plants out in the field until fall, before snow or a lot of rain or frost has come. And these uh, plants are gonna be doing something called drying down, which essentially means that when you get out there, the pods are going to be brown or black, they're going to be really crispy and crackly, and the seeds inside are going to be mature and really dry to touch. Dry as in if you hit them with a hammer, they would not squish, they would crack. And so you're going to bring those seeds inside, and all you have to do is shell the peas or the beans, and then store the peas and beans in paper bags throughout the winter in a really dry location. The really good news about peas and beans is that they are almost always self-pollinated. And this is because they have perfect flowers. Now, perfect flowers means that um, the flowers have both the male and female parts. They have everything that they need to reproduce within themselves. And in addition to being perfect, peas and beans also have this wonderful little part of the flower called a keel. So a keel is a little lip that isolates the stigma. So we really don't have to do much isolation on our own and prevents it from being cross-pollinated. I will add a caveat that bumblebees have been known to rarely go ahead and go in and tear the bee or pea, <laughs> bean or pea flower apart and then pollinate it. Um, in which case your plant would be cross-pollinated, but it happens pretty rarely. So you don't need to be too worried about it. So in order to make sure that your peas and beans are staying true to their variety, all you need to do is isolate them by 10 feet and they should be good to go for saving. All right, and I just wanted to walk you through the process for wildflower seeds as well because they can be saved. And so while most flowers have their own specific needs about how they're processed and saved, um, most of them are saved in a relatively common way. And so I wanted to walk you through how to save from two common ones, Echinacea, also known as cornflower, and Salvia. So if you happen to have a friend who had a lot of these wildflowers because you're not allowed to pick them from open space mountain parks, um, then you could go to their property and when the echinacea or the salvia are fully mature and dry, you can harvest them and all you have to do is turn them upside down into a paper bag, 
tie the bag around them and then make sure to label what is inside of them because as they dry, it can be hard to recognize the flowers. In a couple of weeks, the seeds will drop out of the dried pods um, into the base of the paper bag. So you can go ahead and empty them out at that point. The last step is that the seeds have this um, papery husk around the outside of them, usually called the chaff. And so you have to separate the seed from that. You can do that in a couple of different ways, by either crumbling them between your hands, um, you can lay them out on a cookie sheet and lightly blow a fan on them, and the papery husk will float away. Uh, or you could also put them through a sieve as long as it's the right size for those wildflower seeds. Once that's done, all you have to do is put them in a paper bag and store them in a very dry location until you're ready to plant them next year. So I'm guessing one of your takeaways from tonight is that plants have very specific needs, but I do hope that this has inspired you to try planting and then saving seed from some heirlooms and open pollinated plants in your garden next year. If you have any specific questions along your seed saving journey, I would definitely encourage you to check out books like Seed Swap by Josie Jeffries and then Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth. They've been helpful for me along my journey and Boulder Public Library happens to have both of them in their collection. If YouTube tutorials are your thing, then Seed Savers Exchange has a wonderful YouTube that will take you step by step through how to isolate different um, species and then also how to process them appropriately. I hope that this video has inspired you to find an heirloom that you are passionate about. For me, it was Cherokee Purple Tomatoes because I just loved the taste of them and I loved how they looked. Um, so, you know, I hope you find one that you love and then you dig into its requirements and get saving them. Uh, one thing that I've always found inspiring is that seeds from one fruit, as we saw tonight with the peppers and the tomatoes, can provide enough um, seeds for the whole block next year. And so with that, I wish you luck and let's move on to any uh, lasting questions. Awesome. Uh, Jess, are there some new questions? I'm guessing there are. <laughs> yes, um, there was a question about cucumbers. If you could speak to how you save cucumbers. Absolutely. So cucumbers, there's some fun things about saving cucumber seeds. Um, let's start with uh, the fact that they are a wet seed and similarly to tomatoes they like to go through a little bit of a fermentation um, this fermentation as i mentioned with tomatoes it helps mimic the rot um, from the fruit being on the ground um, before you know the fruit kind of decomposes and then the seeds are left in the ground to reseed itself and so i would ferment um, the cucumber seeds for ooh, not as long as tomatoes so maybe one to three three days, again, in a warm jar. And then after that, go through the process of um, rinsing them and then drying them and make sure to label them throughout the entire process. Uh, re in regards to when to harvest cucumbers for the seeds to be mature, um, the cucumbers you're going to be eating at the store or from the farmer's market are harvested when they're actually quite young. And so that's because if you're eating a cucumber, opening it up, it's not too pleasant to bite into one and then have a large seed that you're chewing on. And so the fruits need to be left on the vine actually far past their market size. Um, so once they are quite large, often they'll turn yellow, they may even get a little mushy, then it's great to bring them inside, cut them in half, uh, the long way, and then go ahead and send them through that process of fermenting them. I hope that helps. It, Thank it's you. It's the same for melons and squash. Okay. Um, I've had a number, so the Boulder Public Library has a, a seed library, and which is not open this year, but will be open in the spring. And they're mostly donated seeds. So they're seeds that were grown for the previous year's market and then weren't sold. And so the seed companies donate them to us. We also have some community members that donate seeds. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of questions about seed life. So if you save your seeds, how long are they viable for? How much does the germination decrease? And are there any specific varieties that you need to be really wary of that they're only good for a year or something like that? 
that is a really good question. Um, so across the board, all seeds, their first year after being harvested, um, have the best germination rates. That's just their most viable year. It's a great year to plant them. But if you go through the process and you're very careful, you're keeping your seeds in a cool, dark location while they're drying, um, you've harvested them at peak maturity, um, you sent them through the fermentation process and did not leave them in the water too long to the point where they actually start to kind of germinate themselves, um, then the shelf life for seeds, and it does vary on species, is anywhere from, I would say, three to 10 years, typically. For most seeds that you're going to see in a garden in Boulder County, um, I would say the mean year would be five. Uh, every year, though, that you leave those seeds in maybe a cool, dark box in your closet or something, their viability lessens. And so they, they do lose out on germination rates the longer you leave them. Um, so if you were one of the people who maybe when the pandemic hit and you bought a lot of seeds online and didn't get to planting all of them and you don't think you'll be able to in the next three to five years, definitely, you know, share the wealth with your peers and your friends, um, because, you know, it is important that we're planting the seeds that we do have. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Yes, thank you. The, we typically do have seed swaps at the library, so that's a really good opportunity if folks buy extra seeds and want to try some yeah. new ones that they didn't get themselves. Um, so yeah. stay tuned. There will be hopefully seed swaps in the future when the pandemic is over, as well yes. as access to our, to our seed library. Well, um, I think that... <laughs> a little bit of a lack. Um, but I want to add that Colorado seed laws do allow um, seed swaps, seed swaps to happen. Um, do make sure that you don't have any um, weed seeds, as in like noxious or invasive weeds, in when you're going to those seed swaps, so that you, um, you know, hopefully will have labeled your seeds well, and then that's the only seed that's in that packet. For that reason, I also usually advise advise against making like a seed mixture um, that you're then going to swap with someone, um, just so there's some traceability to it. Uh, but in general, come I would say from March to May in Boulder County, there are quite a few seed swaps um, that I've seen advertised online and have attended a few. And it's been a really, really fun time because you have people there who this is their first time saving seeds, or maybe this is how they're getting their seeds to, you know, learn how to save them to really seasoned pros who have been doing it. Uh, I don't know their whole lives and can um, share some absolute wisdom with you as you embark on your process. So definitely check out the seed swaps come spring. Yeah, our only caveat after talking with the Colorado Department of Agriculture is seed laws in Colorado don't allow you to share any open packets of commercially packed seed. And so saving seeds at home and bringing your own seeds is definitely the way to go when you go to a seed swap. Oh, we do have two other questions now um, as we're almost out of time. Are you still good, Fern, in terms of the fire and everything? Yeah. Are you OK answering just a couple more? OK. Um, yes. Okay, thank you so much for your, your poise with all of this going on outside of your house. Um, so there's a question of when storing in paper bags, is there a certain quantity of dried seeds that should be avoided in one bag? That is a really good question. If your seeds are dried properly, and I mean if, if for a pepper seed or a tomato seed, if you were to put that seed down on a counter and hit it with a hammer, it would crack, it wouldn't squish. Um, and so that's the level of dryness we're talking about. Sometimes I'll actually try to like bite one and see if my tooth will dent it, um, just to make sure that it's fully dry. So if you are packaging those seeds for storage when they are fully dry, then it really doesn't matter how many of them are in the bag. Another little precaution you could take if you're scared about having too many in a bag or maybe um, a bag of them going um, poorly or something like that, um, is to sort out any discolored or strange looking seeds that don't really look like the rest that may be rotten or immature or something. Um, so again, only harvesting and storing seeds from your best fruit, but then also only storing your best looking seeds, you know? Um, but otherwise, yeah, no, no, uh, what would that be? No, no space requirements for how many of them per bag. And then, um, Two more questions. First one, uh, at the very beginning, you sort of mentioned seed sovereignty. 
and biodiversity. And I've talked to a lot of folks um, about kind of the benefits of saving seeds from your specific yard. So I wonder if you could men kind of speak to that, like seed sovereignty, as well as the wonderful aspects of your locally grown, locally adapted seeds. Absolutely. Yeah, there's um, a definite growing movement, and I'll use the word growing specifically because it's not new. Specifically in indigenous communities, this movement has existed um, since seeds really became privatized, if you will, or the burden or the uh, responsibility of saving seeds has been put in seed companies' hands. There's been a movement for um, a, a call to action for people to be saving these seeds themselves, to um, take care of their own communities, um, to take growing food into their own hands and into their own neighborhoods. Um, and then they're also, you know, beyond the social responsibility, if you will, of saving seeds, there are also the environmental responsible responsibility aspects, which would obviously be biodiversity. I mean, the more people growing a Cherokee purple and saving that seed in different locations, um, in maybe even the same town, the more little diverse aspects and the more resilience that breed then has. Uh, there also have been instances where I believe we've been entirely short on seeds for certain well-known um, varieties. Delicata squash comes to mind. There was a time when I believe Delicata squash specifically was at risk of going extinct. And so seed companies said, hey, home gardeners, do you have seeds from this that you properly saved? We need to replenish our number of seeds that we have saved for Delicata so that we don't lose this delicious strain of squash. Um, and then so biodiversity, um, making sure we're not running out of those different varieties. Um, and then also, as I mentioned briefly at the start, uh, it regionally adapts every lineage that grows in a certain region. So if you're growing um, a corn maybe in arid Colorado, and slowly but surely you wean it off over the years so that it's really not being irrigated, that's absolutely possible because that seed learns in its DNA how to grow in that place. And so with climate change and with seeing, you know, our seasons get a little bit weirder and more unpredictable, it's really important that we have resilient seeds, that we have local seeds, and we have seeds that know how to grow um, where they are and that adapt year to year. If you're ordering your seeds from Maine, and you're wanting them to grow really well in Boulder, well, time it's really too similar. And so, uh, you know, there there are immense benefits to it, and there are also a lot of books on seed sovereignty. So go ahead and check out at Boulder Public Library their collection of books on this topic because it is immense, um, the number of books and media that have been created around this topic. Thank you. One more question, and then I think we'll, we'll wrap it up. Is there a good resource for determining the necessary populations or number of, of plants for cross-pollination of wildflowers? Are some wildflowers self-pollinating? Fun, that's a fun question. Um, lean on diversity as your friend. <laughs> as in, um, you know, planting a big variety of them, but not only having one of each type of plant, because even if, um, you have two of them, for instance, two echinacea in the same field or something, and they need to be cross-pollinated, then it's there's it's not guaranteed that that's going to happen um, when, when there are so many other places for pollinators to stop or for wind to blow through. Um, and so getting a good mixture, um, planting a lot of um, diverse types of plants with multiple types of each plant is your best bet for saving seeds, even for tomatoes which are self-pollinated and you don't need to worry about planting two of them for the same, um, in order to harvest seeds. I like to lean on planting five to 10 of those, of those plants and then saving from them. This is because obviously diseases can happen and you can lose a whole crop and how terrible it would be to lose all of your seeds that you've saved throughout the years. Um, it's also because you wanna save your best seeds. And there's a short window really in Boulder County where you're having your healthiest looking tomatoes. And so if you can harvest 40 tomatoes that are all really wonderful firsts, if you will, for tomatoes, wonderful size, wonderful um, texture, um, no um, deformities or signs of disease, then that's much better than maybe harvesting six um, tomatoes that, you know, kind of fit that uh, qualification. And so 
I would lean on always planting more than one of a plant if you're wanting to save seeds. Again, five to 10 is what I generally say. Okay, thank you so much, Fern. This was this wonderful. Good, I've learned a lot. Um, and I want to thank you again for being a resource during this time, creating this online content so we can still do garden programs, even though we can't gather in person at the Edible Learning Garden at the main library. It's been wonderful to learn from you this season. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. And I, I'm grateful for Poundless Landscapes participating in this with you as their ambassador. Um, again, I want to say thank you to the Boulder Library Foundation for making this possible. And then also shout out to Celine, um, my coworker who's been behind the scenes for all of this, making it work smoothly online. So thanks, Celine. And with that, I think we'll we'll call this an end to our program and stay safe, Fern. I hope the the fire is dealt with and taken care of, and your land is okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We so appreciate your questions and your participation.